Rakan Slyman and Veronica Oniswara of Leo, uh, where uh, we will be learning how to build flexibility into the commercial strategy. As always, I will be back for the Q&A, but for now, Rakan and Veronica, all yours. Thank you for that, Dario. Hi, everybody. My name is Rakan Sleiman. Um, I'm part of the product organization at Actana. And as Dario mentioned, I'm very pleased to be joined by Veronica Onishawara from Leo Pharma's customer engagement team. Before starting, we thought we would ask ourselves, ask the audience, to really think about, to them, what does it mean to have a flexible commercial strategy and why is that important? And when we think about this in the context of a brand, a specific brand strategy, um, really the one true common denominator that exists as you move between regions and into individual markets is the product itself. Um, and this could be the drug at a molecular level or a medical device. They're ultimately treating the same target patients or the same symptoms. Another way that I like to think about this slide is illness really has no borders. And if you just focus in on that concept, it absolutely does make sense that brand strategy is defined at a global level before cascading its way down to, to different regions and then different individual markets within those regions. Now, the reality of it is when you actually look at the way brand strategy is being executed, um, as you move between regions and even between markets, it looks different or arguably very different between two given markets. And there's many reasons for this. And a lot of these, I think a lot of us can, can, um, can re they resonate with us. So we have, there's different cultures, different languages at play. You may or may not have um, authorization to actually promote a product in one market, but you can in another market. HCPs, patients, they have their different needs, their different requirements, their own preferences. Um, do, we, do you have the right channels available to engage those HCPs? And if you do, is there content available to use on those channels? And then, of course, there are you know, a lot of constraints that we have to work on. And we heard a few of these in the previous, in the previous session around reg regulatory legal compliance that we have to work around when thinking about how to engage with our HCPs or our customers. You may or may not have data available in one market that's available in another market, or it could be much more granular in one market versus another market. And, and then of course the technology, technological landscape can look very different as you move between different markets um, and different regions. What does this lead to? There ends up being a tendency to want to pilot AI solutions um, for a given brand in a given market, showing the value of that solution and then almost repeating it for another brand within that market and then potentially another brand until you kind of enable all of the brands and then think about, I want to move this to another market. Derek touched on this a little bit in the keynote at the start. Uh, this can be cost prohibitive in the sense that you, are, you end up rebuilding a lot of the data pipelines to enable these AI solutions. And this, to some degree, brings us to, to the problem statement, like how can we make it much more efficient to deliver AI solutions? And for that matter, to the answer to the question at the start around what is a flexible commercial strategy? You have it here on the screen. Um, this is a definition that Veronica and I kind of landed on, which is a flexible commercial strategy delivers efficiencies as omni-channel strategies cascade down from global to local while ensuring learnings are leveraged across markets. You might be looking at this and asking yourselves, how do we know if we actually have a flexible commercial strategy at play? At the bottom, there's, let's say, some attributes of this. So, if you have one, it will be leveraging common properties of your brand strategy. It will be accounting for known variations. And then my favorite one is um, it allows for cross-brand pollination. And I'll come on in a little bit to explain what we mean by this. However, um, this definition, as I mentioned, is something Veronica and I have spoken about a little bit. I do want to kind of allow Veronica to respond 
to this definition in the context of what Leo Pharma are doing? Yes, uh, thank you, Rakan. Indeed, also in, uh, in the experiences that I have so far, I have seen that the same commercial strategy principles that you are describing here are applied as well. So I would say that first, um, the global marketing team is building the brand strategy uh, for a digital ecosystem these days, providing connected customer experience with continuously improved content. Then secondly, the omnichannel engagements are now integrated uh, locally in the customer journey model, combining global, but also local insights and principles. Additionally, um, the brand behavioral profiling can take the segmentation to the next level by tailoring the brand key messaging to the personalized segment. Therefore, with so many omnichannel variables, we really need to have in place um, frameworks, processes, and also tools which can support us in, in building the right commercial strategy. Thank you, Veronica. I think rehearing you say that again, um, as, as we've discussed this, I feel that I've done a disservice not highlighting the word omnichannel on this definition. As you rightly highlight, um, cascading down an omnichannel strategy is, is much harder than cascading down, let's say, a single or a, or a strategy with just a couple of channels. So people are probably looking at this and asking themselves, all right, I like this conceptually, but how do we set ourselves up to implement a flexible commercial strategy. And what we've put together is a six point plan of how you can begin to set, to get yourselves to where we're saying you can get yourselves to. The first of these, standardize on your CRM and data systems. Um, what do we mean? Leverage the same CRM provider. This may sound obvious, but we have worked with organizations in the past where you may have one or more markets who have a homegrown CRM system in place and then a bunch of other markets using the same CRM provider or another CRM provider. You really do want to try and standardize on your CRM. I emphasize here that you don't actually need to have a single CRM instance globally. By all means, you may have good reason to have an instance for the US market and then another instance potentially for Europe and what not, but you do really want to try and, and standardize on your CRM configuration. And what this ultimately means is the data model looks very similar as you move from your CRM in the US to your CRM in, in, in Europe. In a similar vein, your technology stack, you do want to standardize on it. You know, you, if you're using one marketing automation tool in one market, you really do want to try and have the same marketing automation systems in other markets. Um, and the same is true, whether it's, you're talking of event management, whether you have a data warehouse that you're using or your, or your sales data pipelines. And then finally, consolidate and integrate systems where possible. I always stress this, that marketing automation systems, event management systems, a lot of the times they come with integrations into your CRM. Right. If you do have this integration possible, bring the two worlds as close to possible, as, as close together as possible, because it gives a better user experience. You kind of having all of the data in one place. That's from a user perspective. But also, if you're working with different analytics teams, different data science teams, makes it much easier for them to access this information. Second up, align on common data requirements. The way I think about this is as the brand team are thinking about how they want to execute on their strategy and they're thinking about their target customers, really do standardize on a significant or a substantial um, set of value adding data that is relevant to the, to the brand. On the left, there's a few examples that will no doubt be valuable, segmentations, adoption, specialty. But you'd be asking yourselves, is speaker skills something that we want to understand is engaging HCBs to promote our brand a part of our global brand strategy and add it to that list. As you build up this list of, of data points, let's call it that way, um, you will start to notice, and this comes to the earlier comment of cross-pollination of uh, your, your brand strategy, cross-pollinating other brands. 
you will start to see that these data points actually are of value to other brands within the market itself or, or across markets. So another way that I, I always talk about this, at least internally in Actana, is we need to start thinking of alignment first on metadata and then on data. And I have a kind of a, a good example with the green dot and a not so good example with the red dot. The green dot is, think of it as all of our, we're using a single segmentation field to understand all of our customers globally. We're using a single specialty field to understand all of our customers globally versus a not so good example where you have a different field um, per market or even per product. It becomes much harder to access and, and use and leverage this data as you're trying to execute on your brand strategy. Third up, it's almost the flip side, and I've touched on a little bit of this already, but agree on the known differences and allow for them. You have to allow for them, otherwise it just won't work. And I've split this up into two different, two different uh, parts, if you like. One, which we're calling common differences. And when you think about things like HTTP preferences, channel preferences, availability content, this is true, these will be different. The data itself underneath this will be different, but it's true within a market and across market versus other types of differences. The fact that culturally we, we have our differences, we all speak different languages. You may or may not be able to, to promote the product, as I mentioned earlier. The constraints that are truly a result of, it, it's, it looks this way in France versus this way in Spain versus this way in, in um, in the US, the data available, the granularity of it, the technologies available, et cetera. And from my perspective, the way we think about this is you do need to have the right data model and technologies to allow you to manage these variations. Fourth up, uh, set an opt-out strategy for execution channels and enable them all. The way I always talk of this is it's 2022, technology should not be a blocker. I joke all the time, I think two weeks ago, I was in San Francisco, I'm speaking with my five-year-old daughter on a video call. Point being that, you know, across all age demographics, people are comfortable with using different kinds of channels to communicate. Channel without consent is meaningless. Focus on actually generating consent so that you can engage with an HCP, um, through a virtual call if that's the channel which you're trying to engage with them. Consent and channel available is all great. If you don't have the right content to leverage on that channel, the channel will not be adopted. It will not make sense. Focus on creating the right content. Understand your HCP preferences. Some HCPs want to have digital engagements. Others, of course, prefer face-to-face -face communication. And then finally, I, I always emphasize, let's not forget about the users, right? And, and who are the users here? It's the actors, the field team, potentially, the people who are helping execute on your strategy. Um, you may have a field team that are not ready. They don't want to use virtual calls. They don't want to engage digitally. You do need to understand this. And, and in understanding this, you can set the right um, let's say change management in place or training and onboarding so that they are able to actually make the most of these channels when they become available. And then to kind of close this up, let consent, let the content, let your understanding of the users and HCPs drive channel adoption. Fifth, embed intelligence into field users' workflows. I think it's very clear that the right user experience truly does drive engagement. Single app, not multiple applications. You really don't want your users to have to go to different places to pick up different pieces of insights or the output of analytics um, for them to understand that. One place, all encompassing sales insights is there, digital engagement insights is there. In the same way, users within markets, you wanna consolidate everything. As you move from, to use the example on the screen, Spain to the UK, really all of your users should be consuming those insights in the same place, right? So try and keep it as consistent as possible as you move across markets and let the difference be 
data driven, right? So it's the actual data that's making it change, um, more making the experience change. And of course, the benefit of doing something like this is if you do build your own application, right? It's a one-off, uh, it's a one-off development effort, and it becomes easier to actually manage that, much more cost-effective to manage that um, over the life cycle of your your project or your um, in your, your project. Finally, to close this out, um, use the 80-20 rule. We speak of this often inside Actan, and to, to, to almost summarize this, you do want to try and start by, by having 80, almost an 80% um, uh, le leveraging standard design 80% of the time, right? And then allow for 20% of 20% of customization. Of course, it might, you might not get there, it might be slightly different, it might have to be slightly different for you, but know what your own 80-20 rule is. And then once you start leveraging, let's say, a set amount of standardization, start to measure the way um, customizations creep in. And the reason why I say this is because it's, it's expected, it's absolutely normal that um, over the course of time within a market, new requirements become, uh, become known, new data becomes available, and you might need to bring in that level of customization to support that market need. But as you measure this variation um, over the course of time, it allows you with the right governance model to begin identifying opportunities in that variation because there may be data that actually would be valuable to all of the, the markets within a given region or potentially even globally. So that's the six point um, plan. Me talking through this, I can imagine a lot of people listening and, and almost saying, wow, that sounds like mission impossible. I don't see how we can get there. Um, why, like, why should we be doing this? And I, I feel this is, the, this is the best part to almost bring in um, Veronica and Ishwara, who will um, almost take, like give her perspective, how impossible is this? And then take people through what Leo Pharma are doing and how they're beginning to benefit from a lot of the stuff that we've just spoken about. Thanks, Rakan. I would say that uh, the answer is no, it's not uh, mission impossible um, because we uh, already benefit from uh, the investments um, done globally in Leo to implement uh, such a program, next best action, uh, for driving especially omnichannel execution. So let me give you an overview of, uh, of Leo plans and what has been achieved uh, so far. Reflecting about the uh, Leo Pharma transformation journey towards uh, 2030 strategy, um, there are specific priorities identified uh, in the organization linked to omnichannel for delivering the right uh, results. Uh, we have uh, a focus, a high focus on, on a fully integrated ecosystem and it is built, uh, it, it is being built as we speak and enables uh, the orchestration of seamless uh, ACP experience and cross-channel engagement journeys. Another area of focus is this uh, new engagement mindset and strong digital skills and capabilities across commercial uh, functions are being put in place by our training uh, managers and, and partners. Clear frameworks and for planning and dashboards to measure impact and to provide actionable insights are being established across the organization. And uh, not ultimately, customer centricity is being developed uh, for supporting us in delivering personalized uh, messages uh, across the customer journeys. So these would be the areas where uh, Leo Pharma is directing uh, the resources uh, currently in the near and in the nearby future. Next slide, please. In the same direction of keeping uh, customer centricity as a focused area, from 2021, Next Best Action program launch in, uh, in EU key markets has been prioritized at Leo Pharma. And the tool is already supporting today our commercial team members to optimize their communication path and to be more consistent with the planning and the, and the execution. And the driving reason was that uh, to implement such a tool was that in a market like US, 
we saw initially a very clear link with the with the sales performance, of course, because of the granularity of uh, of the data as well, which allowed us to to make such a, such an analysis. The tool can serve as a salesperson co-pilot, triggering uh, omnichannel suggestions, as we all know, and insights uh, that are being prioritized based on on their impact. The sales reps are presented with the most relevant and and uh, contextual information. Uh, already every day in the CRM uh, workflow, enabling them to be more, more efficient in, in this way and to consistently make um, better business decisions and to drive higher commercial, uh, commercial performance. On the other hand, I would say that the healthcare professionals receive a much more uh, tailored and uh, personalized uh, customer experience uh, in, in this way. Next slide, please. Back in Q3 2021, we have started to work on building the required uh, core assets needed for this uh, European implementation. Therefore, a standard uh, EU solution is currently available for the individual country deployments, and this solution can be run in parallel to accelerate time to value in line with our business uh, needs. Based on LEO data sets, um, the recommended use cases and capabilities are including um, multi-channel cycle planning, uh, historical interactions data, segmentation, uh, marketing automation, emails, insights, uh, sometimes also opt-in recent information, event management data, but also market sales data available across, uh, across the affiliates. The countries can choose to activate use cases from the core library, also following the principle that you are describing uh, before Akan, uh, the 80-20 um, standardization flexibility rule, or they can also propose new ones based on, on a specific strategic uh, need. In order to, be, to launch the, the program at scale and, and fast, uh, we have followed agile way of working, uh, ways of working, so that we keep close collaboration with the countries and uh, address their needs. Um, next slide, please. There are still early days uh, for some of the countries' results, but um, I uh, I could share al already some uh, some learnings that we have seen. NBA requires extra steps for the application to be maximized, but very, fairly quickly, the teams have embraced the system and benefited from the application. I would say that practice and patience are key elements in the first two, three weeks from launch. And thinking about the learnings when launching the solution, it is important to spend the necessary time to communicate all the details related to, to it, how it works, what are the benefits, answer all the business questions and involve key functions uh, such as uh, sales, marketing, training, so that the tool becomes uh, part of the new ways of working across the whole uh, organization. In terms of KPIs set up for understanding the solution uh, effectiveness, besides the feedback and the surveys collected, we regularly look over the engagement rate associated to the tool utilization and the first results uh, are very encouraging as the rate is higher than the benchmark with the uh, 78% seen on a monthly basis compared with the usual benchmark set at around 60-70%. And also the acceptance rate is quite higher, sometimes at around 48-70-50% uh, uh, as well. The suggestions can be triggered by different events, as I was also describing. Um, at Leo Pharma, we have chosen to prioritize the ones linked to multi-channel planning execution, segmentation, and a couple of other criteria linked to the different product uh, life cycles uh, and to the launch phases we are now experiencing with a certain brand. By accepting the suggestions, a better coordination has been sometimes seen between the commercial roles and higher multi-channel achievement rates have been also seen. Complementary to the suggestions, the sales reps do utilize also the accounts insights page, which offers them um, a complete view on the main interactions. 
and uh, also on the sales considerations for that doctor. And it is helpful to have the right insights to be able to make informed decisions, correlations, to know, for example, the engagement responsiveness and have at the same time a view on the potential of that doctor. They now access this page faster as a one-stop insight center about the doctor instead of going to different uh, dashboard. And it is a good way to be uh, better prepared for fast for the whole day or before an interaction. As a conclusion, we see benefits associated with the tool at Leo. And as a next step in the future, uh, we, we hope to have uh, also iterations where we could integrate into the AI module even more insights related especially to customer brand behavior and channel uh, responsiveness. Thank you, Veronica. Um, I think maybe just before closing out with a summary slide, um, I don't know, just rehearing you and re-seeing your deployment plan, um, I would just say just it just feels good from my side because I think, and this was touched upon on Derek's keynote, like when I joined Actana five years ago, um, genuinely, that same deployment plan, instead of one to two months, uh, we were probably looking at three to six months and not going across markets, but kind of doing brand one and then brand two and then brand three within markets. So seeing how fast Leo are being able to move, like truly is testament to a lot of the investments that you guys have made, um, both on the technology side, but also on the brand planning side. So, so it's great. Just genuinely really really nice to see so as, as i mentioned just to quickly close out um six point plan things that you can be doing to set yourselves up standardize on your crm standardize on other data systems align on common um, properties that are shared across brands and markets agree on the differences those differences exist for a reason allow for them set out set an opt-out channel an opt-out strategy for execution channels enable them all embed intelligence into your users workflow and then finally use the 80 20 rule to identify opportunities to improve and also work very efficiently and with that um, we will welcome back dario and have a bit of a q a session fantastic thanks a lot rakan and of course veronica great session indeed and we received a couple of very interesting questions uh, but one in particular is uh, especially, I would say, interesting to, to, the, to the wide audience, and it's raised to Veronica, which is in addition to the field sales team's roles, how can solutions like Actanas support order organizational roles such as MSLs, medical, or key account managers? And is there a solution that's tailored for all commercial functions? So what is the benefit of adopting it? So actually, we, have, we got three questions, but uh, please, Veronica. Take your time. <laughs> Thank you, Dario. I will try to be short. So I think uh, we have a lot of benefits associated with a solution designed for multiple roles because um, uh, from what we have seen, there is this better coordination uh, undergone between the different functions if um, all their interactions or their key account management plans could be seen commonly uh, across the organization. Besides the, the regulations that we need for sure to embed into the solution, um, so sometimes we cannot uh, share all the details uh, due to regulations across, uh, across the different uh, commercial roles. Besides uh, that particular uh, situation that we need to put in place, I would say that there are a lot of benefits associated, especially uh, because uh, we could understand, for example, um, when a colleague would, uh, would visit a certain ACP and then we could better plan for our agenda so that we visit that ACP uh, one day later or at another point in time so that we have a better coordination seen in that particular week. Um, additionally, we have seen that uh, there are insights um, requested by our commercial uh, colleagues so that they can see um, the high level discussions performed by the MSL 
um, colleague when he goes and, and uh, contacts uh, an ACP. And in this way, they keep uh, the discussion undergone afterwards. So that would be around the coordination uh, piece of uh, work. Thanks a lot, Veronica. So fantastic session, as said. We are taking a very, very quick break, literally one or two minutes, but we will see you again for the next session and really enjoyed in that one. So thanks again, Rakan. Thanks again, Veronica. Pleasure to listen to you. Thank you all. Thank you.